Okay, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. I am Kino with the STEM with Kino.com. I'm taking out the uh, earphones. I was here, and um, this is the second installment of the aviation pre flight indoctrination and undergraduate pilot training um, prep course. This is also helpful to you guys that are in the initial flight screening because there's some things that you need to know in this uh, module. So first thing I'm going to do is just uh, jump right in. <clears throat> Last week uh, we covered definitions and we're going to have more definitions. We'll have definitions every time. Um, let me make sure I got my right screen up and we can get underway here. So First thing we're going to do is uh, in this installment, this is going to be, this is one of three. We did the first installment. Uh, the second installment, this is the second installment, and there's going to be a third. And anybody that's actually done test prep with me uh, is welcome to just join. Typically, every Thursday night at 8 o'clock, we're running a little late tonight because I had some uh, things I needed to take care of. But at any rate, this is being recorded. and. Um, you know, basically that's where we are. So the first thing we're going to talk about is uh, we're going to talk about the major components of an aircraft. So let's define an aircraft. An aircraft is any, de any device used or intended to be used for flight. All right, so if we're going to get an aircraft and we're going to go from point A to point B, uh, be it for transportation, reconnaissance, uh, some other type of photo mission or something like that. We will need an aircraft to do it. There's two types of aircraft. There are fixed wing and there are rotary wing. But primarily what we're going to talk about today are fixed wing aircraft because this is the API UPT prep. And I guess I could go into helicopters or rotary wing as well, but primarily airplanes is what we're going to deal with. All right, so an aircraft or an aircraft could be considered an airplane a glider or a helicopter. So it's a device used to be intended to be used for flight. Um, so let us do our thing here. And I want to reduce this screen. And I want to pull up another screen. And give me a sec, folks. Okay, here we are. Um, so I'm going to pull up the screen and I'm going to pull up some images. I talk about five major components of uh, screen share. Okay, so there are five major components of aircraft, and here are just some things now. You notice um, some similarities about all these aircraft. As I scroll down, let's scroll down, and then I will scroll back up. I wanted to get some variation, and it's probably like the best, as good as it's going to get. So, whether you're flying a light aircraft or a, um, basically, you're going to have five major components. And whether it's this little guy or this big guy here, normally you will have five major components. The first component is the fuselage. Right, so the fuselage is kind of like the major piece that holds everything together. So here's the aircraft fuselage here, and here's the aircraft fuselage here. It kind of, the fuselage kind of houses the cockpit, cargo, passengers, equipment, cargo, you know, things of that nature. 
All right, so this is pretty much the body that holds everything together. Um, our next um, component we're going to discuss are the wings. The wings are responsible for pro providing lift. So you see that both of these aircraft have wings. All right, so that's component one and two. Number three, it's going to have a power plant or power plants. Um, you could call them engines, but I call them power plants as well because uh, they don't, in many cases, the, the engines just don't provide thrust. A lot of times they provide a lot of accessory components, uh, like, you know, they could be connected to an alternator system to provide electrical energy for the aircraft. Um, so we call them power plants um, sometimes, you know, so engines, they are engines, but power plants are also a name for them. Um, so that's the fuselage the wings, the power plants. Uh, we're going to talk about something called the empennage. The empennage is a French word. It just means tail section. So what you will see is you will see a tail section. And the tail section does something special. It's actually responsible for the stabilization of the aircraft, kind of like a dart. You know, this will be the front part of the dart, this will be the rear, this will be the front part of the dart, and this will be the rear. So as the dart or the airplane travels through the air, there is a tail section responsible for just helping maintain stabilization. Now, in airplanes, we have our empennage is broken down into two sections. One is the vertical stabilizer, and one is the horizontal stabilizer. Now, we have some other components. When we talk about the wings, all right, we have ailerons here, positioned on the outside. And this aircraft has ailerons as well, but we can't really see them that well because of the paint job. We can see the ailerons here on the outside, and then we have flaps on the inboard part or the root area of the wing. This will be the wing root. Right, let's go on this side. This will be the wing root, and this will be the wing tip. Here, this will be the wing root, and on the outside, this will be the wing tip. Um, now back to our empennage, our vertical stabilizer is just like in your back, your vertebrae, it goes straight up and down. So vertical stabilizer, then the horizontal stabilizer. Now the vertical stabilizer um, basically houses the rudder and the horizontal, horizontal stabilizer houses the elevator. So our primary control surfaces are ailerons, elevator, and rudder. So that is something that you would need to know. All right, I'm gonna stop sharing screens for a second. Use the screen so I can come back to my talking points. So basically we talked about the, an aircraft. All right, any, any devices used to be, that's used or intended to be used for flight, an airplane, uh, it's a mechanically driven, fixed plane, heavier than air. Uh, lighter than air would be like a, a blimp or hot air balloon. That is the way that it obtains flight. Um, and our fuselage, we talked about that, but the basic structure to which all the other components are attached. Come on down. Uh, the wings. Uh, oh, oh, and we failed to mention one more thing. See, it's a good thing I looked at my uh, talking points. Um, one thing that we failed, or I failed to mention, is the landing gear. And let me, there are a couple types of landing gear that we'll talk about. All right, let's bring up some images here. So we'll go back to screen share. And these are different types of landing gear that we're about to look at now. So the landing gear is responsible for steering the aircraft on the ground and supporting the weight of the aircraft on the ground. So when the airplane takes flight, the wings aerodynamically take on the weight of the aircraft. And when we land, we can see the landing gear here, that's a plane that just pretty much just landed, just touched down on the ground. Um, it is responsible for supporting the weight of the aircraft. Oh, that's not good. One of the landing gear probably failed. So we have a tricycle type gear, which we have, and think about your tricycle, you have two 
wheels on the back, and then you have a nose wheel in the front. And this nose wheel actually steers. Let's see if we can find, okay, well, we got this aircraft taken off, and we can see the two main gear, and then we can see the nose gear. The nose gear is very sensitive because it has moving parts. And um, so we want to be very, very easy. You know, we don't want to be landing at um, high speeds or higher speeds than are recommended by the aircraft manufacturer. And there's a couple different types. Uh, we have fixed gear. And if we look at the Cessna 172 down here, these landing gear do not retract. They stay outside the whole time the aircraft is in play. Whereas you can see this, air, this, this landing gear, it's probably the nose gear retracting. So it is actually after you take off and get into the air and the wings aerodynamically take on the weight of the aircraft, this landing gear actually stows into the belly of the aircraft. Uh, that's another bad day too there. Uh, let's see here. Um, so I just wanted to make sure I got all my talking points. Yeah, there's a lot of pictures of guys having a bad day. Now, we talked about the tricycle type gear. There's also what we call conventional gear, where we have two wheels in the front and a small wheel in the back. This is what most people are commonly referred to as tail draggers. You'll see this in, the, in, in a lot of the older, older models. And landing gear can also be skids or they could be pontoons. This is a seaplane. This aircraft can actually land on water. So, um, you know, there are various different types of landing gear that um, can be used. And I just want to also come back. Now, this is a, um, I guess you could call this a conventional empennage because a horizontal stabilizer is down below. But then you could also have a T-tail where the horizontal stabilizer is actually at the top. And then you have the vertical stabilizer. So now in a lot of aircraft, aircraft the bait at the base or I guess at the lower part of the empennage you would have the horizontal stabilizer and then the vertical stabilizer and rudder stick up but in some aircraft you could have a t-tail aircraft and um, where let's blow that up a little bit where the it looks like a T if you look at it that is our t-tail configuration when it comes to um, the empennage. Okay, moving right along. Um, 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 um. Okay, we discussed landing gear. We talked about the engine. We talked about a couple different types of uh, landing gear. Now, in the here are some. Um, bring this out. Okay, so let's give ourselves, and eventually you'll be winding up in an aircraft called the T-6. Let's get a picture of this thing. Okay, so got a little bit of the wing cut off here, but um, here is our T-6 aircraft. All right. And wrong. There we go. OK. Here's our T-6 aircraft. We can see some of the uh, major components. We can see the landing gear. We can see the engine or power plant. We can see the empennage. We can see the fuselage, which is the main body that houses the, let's get my little cursor up here, which houses the, the mouse is not cooperating. You know what, I think it's because it's on a white background. All right, so what I can do is, um, okay, so this is the fuselage. All right. And so we have our engine or power plant, our propeller, 
They were landing gear. This is a tricycle type. The T6 has tricycle type landing gear with a steerable nose wheel. And we have our tail section or empennage. That is the vertical stabilizer. And as we look from above, we can see the horizontal stabilizer. And then we have the main wings. And we can see that there's a taper, which we will discuss in a little bit. Okay. So let's come back to our talking points and move on. So those are the five major components. Uh, if an aircraft is considered to be an aircraft, it's going to always have these five major components. Some airplanes have uh, two, two sets of wings, like one above the other. So as we look from the front, we would have a fuselage here. And some of the older planes would have the wing up top and the wing on the bottom. That is considered a biplane. Some of the old aircraft even had a, a system where you had three wings, and that would be called a triplane. All right, so biplane, triplane. All right, so the next thing we're going to talk about are airfoils and wing properties. For our purposes, a, an airfoil is any device that's used to produce lift. And we most commonly refer to an airfoil as a wing. So as we look, if we took, if we looked at the airplane from the side, let's say the nose was here and the tail was here, and we looked at the wing from the side, or let's say the nose is this side and the tail is this side. If we looked at it from a side view and we kind of took a slice of that wing, the wing would look something like this. Okay, that's what the wing would look like, and that's like an air airfoil. Now, a little bit of airfoil terminology that you will need to know for API and uh, initial flight screening and UPT. Uh, first thing is we have a leading edge. I'll just put LE. And if we have a leading edge, then there's also just got to be a trailing edge. So leading edge, trailing edge. And this is separated by an imaginary line called a cord line. Okay, it's a little bit uh, crooked a little bit, but it's all right. So then we have an upper camber. Camber merely means curve. We're pilots, so we got to have our own special terminology. And the bottom side would be the lower camber. Right. And then for um, design purposes, we would have what we call a mean camber line. And it's just basically the focus points halfway between the upper and lower surfaces. So the mean camber line would look like this. All right. And I am a little bit off, but the mean camber line is normally curved uh, when you have um, an asymmetrical air performance. An asymmetrical scene says, it's not balanced, so you have your cord line. Now, most helicopter rotors will be what we would call symmetrical airfoils, and probably what they would look like. And I'm going to try to do this as best I can. Okay, so that will be an, a symmetrical air, airfoil, basically the top and the bottom are pretty much the same distance away from the cord line. So this is not the same way. We have more curvature on the top than we do the bottom. And in a symmetrical airfoil, uh, we'll, we'll have the same distance away from the cord line. All right. So um, just looking at my talking points. Um, so another thing we to talk about is um, we can have a positively cambered, symmetrical, or negative, negatively cambered. This is a positive, to positively cambered airfoil. And what we mean by that is a, a, positively, a positively cambered airfoil, the mean camber line is above the cord line. If we had a negatively cambered airfoil, then we would have more curvature at the bottom, and the mean camber line would be kind of floating kind of downward. Okay, and then we have our symmetrical. 
So those are the three types of uh, airfoil. All right. Um, normally, when we think about, um, or when we when when manufacturers design wings, they design wings. And they probably do. A, I'm sure they do. Com, cat use cat or computer assisted assisted drone. So you got to think of this as. And I will revise this if I am wrong. But we would think of the start of the wing as the zero percent point, and the rear of the wing as the 100 percent point. And we want an aerodynamic center. Normally, we want to be around 23 to 27%. This is kind of, and this is, may be off a little bit, but this is where we want the focus, 23 to 27%. Now that's really not, um, and in most flight training programs, I don't think, if you know where the um, aerodynamic center is, that's cool, but it's pretty much where we want most of our lift to be concentrated. Um, now, it will kind of pretty much, your, your lift will pretty much remain there um, unless, you know, the airflow over the wings approaches the speed of sound. Then we got we to gotta talk about shock waves and things of that nature and everything and subsonic going into transonic and then supersonic speeds. All right. And that's for your high, high, higher performance aircraft like guys are looking to fly the F-18. But the aerodynamic center normally stays within the 23 to 27% uh, range. If we think about this airfoil at the beginning being 0% and the, ta the tail or leading edge being the 100% mark. So there's a method to the madness when they design these wings. They just don't, oh, you know, let's make a wing. You know, this is serious because this wing is perfectly designed for the particular aircraft. All right, it's got a, it's going to have a certain wingspan. It's going to it's going to produce a certain amount of lift per square foot. So the wing is probably one of the most important design factors that you are going to deal with if you are building or manufacturing an aircraft, because this is the main thing that is going to support the aircraft in flight. So there's certain de design factors that we're going to talk about in a second here. Um, when we're considering the design of an aircraft. All right, so first thing we're gonna talk about is our wingspan. Pretty much everybody knows what a wingspan is. Wingspan is the length of a wing measured from wingtip to wingtip. So something like a glider would have a very, very large wingspan. So let's just look at the, the, the fuselage of a glider is, is pretty much very slim, very slender, and the wings are kind of like, like this. All right, and I know that's not perfect, but this is what glider wings would look like. Okay. Now, notice the straight, straightness, okay, of that wing. This design is for slow speed aircraft. Aerodynamically, as we look at this, you'll have a very long wingspan on gliders, and that long wing is very, very necessary to keep this aircraft because there is no power plant on a glider. Okay, it's pretty much using updrafts and winds to kind of like keep it in the air and stabilize. And you just kind of like aerodynamically, these wings are like awesome for slow speeds. Okay. And we have a, a lot of wing area due to that wingspan. All right, we've got a lot of wing area. So typically the more wing area that you do have, um, you're gonna generate a lot of lift, okay? But these are very thin, lightweight leg wings. There's no engine nacelles or anything. So pretty much this, this is a very, very, very efficient, all right? Um, wing area, all right, if we had a block wing, and we consider the wing area, let's say like a Cessna 172. Don't laugh at my artwork, guys. All right. Again, 
And actually, we would have something like a taper, not a block. So the Cessna 172's wing would come up, come back like this. And actually, I think there's kind of like a double angle type deal going on. So let's try to be as accurate as possible. Yeah, that's more representative of a Cessna wing. So we have a, a straight, a straight, straight leading edge, but the trailing edge is tapered. All right. So again, this is more or less like a wing, but here there's a taper and there's a, it's a design factor that we're going to talk about in a minute here. All right. So wing air, we're calculating wing, wing area. As wing area is B on C. All right. So when we talk about wing area, we're talking about great basically square footage. B will be the wing span. So boom. And C will be the cord. All right. So we took this distance. All right. Now, let's just say, for our purposes, this was 50 feet, 25 and 25. And let's say this was one foot. Okay. So we had 50 square feet of wing area. And as opposed to, let's say, 16, 16. This one had 32 feet. And let's say we had a two foot wing. And area equals length times width. This would have 64. Now, if we look at this, let's think about wing design. All right. This is thinner, but it has very, very long square feet. And I'm not saying that one inch, one, one, maybe this might be, you know, I won't say two feet. Let's just say one foot. So we have 50 square foot of wing area here which S is uh, represented by. This would be the C, and this would be the B. B is the wingspan. C is the actual uh, cord line. All right. And I'm just talking in general terms. All right. Because sometimes with the change in the, in the trailing edge here, like if you notice, this is shorter. And the cord length here, as we look at it from the top, is a little bit longer. So sometimes when they're designing these wings, they come up with like an average cord. They take the distances, all, all this distance into consideration, and then they come up with an average cord. Well, this has 50 square feet of wing. And I don't even know how, I've never flown gliders. Um, I had a couple of friends that were glider enthusiasts, but I wouldn't even know what, um, let's take a, uh, I can find out real quick. All right. Uh, weight of a glider. Basics for cell plane, weight and balance theory. Okay, so something like uh, cell planes and gliders. They could be around, the empty weight could be 550 and the maximum weight could be like uh, 1,100 pounds. So we have a lot of square footage or wing area for say like a thousand pounds. And that's probably off a little bit, but just digging into the internet, internet here, just doing a little bit of quick research. Uh, and then you take the, uh, let's see here. Gross weight of a Cessna 172. Okay. So 
the, the roughly and a Skyhawk R a 172 R it's like close to 2,500 pounds. So we have 25. We have a 2,500 pound aircraft. I'll use the pound side. And let's say this is 1,100 pounds. All right. So this wing is designed to carry the weight of an 1,100 pound aircraft, roughly. These are not fixed numbers. All right. But with the wing area here, 50 square feet, we have 1,100 pounds. And then uh, with the wing area of 64 uh, square feet, we have a 2,500 airplane, 2,500 pound airplane with pilot, passenger, you know, baggage, fuel, everything like this. So this is none of that. No, no fuel. You might have a small baggage compartment. Okay. And there's the thing. This aircraft does not go as fast. But this aircraft goes fast, and you're going to have a lot, a lot more airflow going over the wing. So the lift per square foot of the wing um, could possibly be greater. I'm going to just venture, or I'm just going to dare, dare to say, yeah, because of the airflow over the wings and lift being produced, as opposed to slower speeds, because the lift generated is also dependent on one factor that it depends on is airflow flowing over the wings as we fly, you know, through the sky, be it in the glider or the uh, Cessna 172. Um, another thing I'm going to um, talk about, we're going to talk about, and we said the straight wing is very, very effective at low speeds. Um, sometimes in a F-18, you may have something like a delta wing like this, this being a fuselage. All right. So it's more of like a delta wing, a delta meaning like a triangle kind of formation there going on. It's more triangular. And triangle, triangular or sweatback wings even, say like your B-1 bomber, well, B-1 B is a variable sweep wing. So that's um, something that we'll go into as well. So in... The Delta or sweatback wing, like a lot of your airliners have sweatback wings, like this. Right. And the fuselage is in the middle. I'll label it by F. So we'll have sweatback wings, and I know this is not even, but I just want you to see the different types of wings that we have. We have a straight wing. We have a Delta wing. Um, the F-18 has also, uh, not F-18, F-15's wings kind of look like this. And no life in my artwork. So in each of these, the fuselage is in the middle. All right. <clears throat> these type aircraft are designed for high speeds. These type aircraft, straight wings, are designed for slower speeds. They're very, very effective because of stall patterns and stuff that we'll, we'll get into. Um, so this a straight wing will have a very, very nice and slow landing speed where we're going to have to come in with come in very fast or a lot at a higher airspeed with a delta wing or swept back wing. Another um, cool thing that they came out, if you guys are familiar with the F-14, the F-111, and the B-1, we have a variable sweep wing, in which at low speeds, the wings can move like this outward, and they're normally computer controlled. I guess the pilot can manually control them as well. At slow speeds, and then at high speeds, the wings can actually assume a position like this. So it's kind of like having the best of both worlds, the fuselage being in the middle. So these wings actually, they move in flight. You know, at slow speed, as we're pulling back on the power and we're preparing for landing, the wings, they kind of like, they, 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 they come out. And I'm trying to kind of match my camera here. So at slow speeds, and then when we go into high speeds or supersonic, or subsonic ranges, the wings kind of just move and the computer just moves them back because it notes the speed. You'll have some type of flight management system or computer system that kind of notices, okay, we're at, I don't know, 180 knots. Wings will come out as opposed to bumping the power, maybe going in a full afterburner. And then the sensors notice, hey, we're going fast. And then the wings will adjust for the most efficient angle for the aircraft 
for yeah for that aircraft. Um, okay. Always losing my mouse, and it's right in front of me. <laughs> so taper, we talked about taper in the 172, where we have kind of like a not a straight, but a kind of slanted uh, trailing edge coming back to the wing or to the fuselage, and then sweep angle. This is what we would call a sweep angle, the angle between the lateral axis. So we looked at this lateral axis, which we will talk about on this airplane. Here's the lateral axis, wingtip to wingtip. So sweep back is the number of degrees, you know, and this could be like, uh, uh, let's just say 30 degrees. So that's what we would call sweep back. It's just the wing design. Um, where this is a zero degree, there is no sweep back. So zero degrees, make my data symbol, all right? So taper, sweep angle, the angle between the lateral axis, and we'll talk about the ax axes, not axes, axes, plural is axes. All right. Um, we also have what we call an aspect ratio. Aspect ratio is the ratio of the wingspan and the average forward. So we take this wingspan and average the aspect ratio, wingspan, um, and average core, we say is one feet. Well, let's say 1.5 AR. Aspect ratio. Um, aspect ratio is wingspan divided by average port. All right, and let's go to our trusty little calculator here, uh, just for speed. Divided by 1.5. Okay, 33.3. That would be the aspect ratio. So we're going to go more in depth, but the aspect ratio is another de design um, uh, characteristic. Um, and that is one way of looking at it. Um, so let me give you another way. Typically, aspect ratio, it is, it is a ratio. So just check my screen here. Um, typically, they don't come in percentages like that. It would be like a three to one aspect ratio. Um, a three to one would be um, like a an aspect ratio B wingspan divided by C or three over three over one. So three over one aspect ratio is kind of like a short stubby wing. Um, and if we had a higher aspect ratio, um, then like a, I don't want to put out numbers because then people, but for our purposes at this point in time, aspect ratio is Bravo over Charlie, which is wingspan over court line. Because you put out numbers and then, you know, you get the trolls come out like, oh, sorry, you got that wrong. They're like, oh, that's not, you know, aspect ratio. You know, you got a lot of guys looking at your videos and stuff like that. And I want to make sure that I give you guys good, solid information. Okay. Because, oh my God, the tro trolls are crazy. Um, so let's talk about the axes of rotation. Not axes, but axes of rotation. Okay. Gotta love. Airplane axes of rotation. Okay. Images. Okay. Okay. So basically, and yeah, let's uh, give a shout out to NASA. This image is produced by NASA. It's not a really good picture. 
I'm sorry, NASA. It's just not. Because I'd like to see the plane or the axes of rotation clearly. Okay. So we've we've covered this. If you've done your uh, your uh, ASTB or AFOQT prep with me, I have three axes, not axes, but we have three axes of rotation. The first one is the vertical. Now here's our airplane and we see our five major components. Now we see one axis going point uh, top to bottom. We have another one going from wingtip to wingtip. And then we have a third one going to, from nose to tail. The nose to tail is the longitudinal axis and we roll about the longitudinal axis. The vertical axis draw about the vertical axis and the lateral axis is wingtip to wingtip and we pitch about the lateral axis. I have um, a video I put out about basic aircraft movements and I recommend you go check that out um, if you just look at my video playlist. Um, so three axes of rotation. Now, we have three axes of rotation and there's movement, which we just mentioned. So here's the airplane flying towards you. We pitch. Now the lateral axis runs from wingtip to wingtip. So imagine this marker and we're pitching. This is the aircraft, nose up, nose down, nose up, nose down. The vertical axis, well, I can't stab this marker through my hand. But the vertical axis would go like this, and basically we yaw about the vertical axis. So you can yaw left and you can yaw right. Um, and it probably looks different in the screen, but you guys know what I mean. Maybe if I do it like this. Okay, so yaw right and yaw left. And for pitch, we pitch nose up, nose down. So you're looking from a tail perspective, all right? And then we roll if the nose to tail axis runs like this we roll about let's put my, my pinky up all right so my pinky and my thumb are the wingtips and we roll we roll okay i'm trying to think of a camera perspective but think of the airplane flying towards you so we could roll left or we could roll right but we roll about the longitudinal axis and i need to go to toys r us because i used to use these cool little planes um, and you can kind of demonstrate a lot better. Now, um, let's give you our next term, which is the angle of incidence. And what other way to show you the angle of incidence in something other than the actual plane you're going to be operating in. Okay. Not you. Let's get this up. Okay. So, here we'll see the longitudinal axis and we'll have another definition that we need to be familiar with. That It's like a hairline. Okay, so here's our. Oh, that's off. That's way off. All right, let's try to match this. Up. Okay, there we go. Here's our longitudinal axis, and it goes from nose to tail. That was pretty good. <laughs> and then we have our chord line. Let's see here. This thing is not cooperating today, is it, guys? So we have our court line, which is the extended, this is the extended imaginary line in the wing. So our, our, our airfoil is like right here. I'll get you. Uh, so here's our airfoil right here. All right. And then we have an angle of incidence, which is the 
different for the angle established by the angle of incidence in the chord line. And you can see it there. You can see the longitudinal axis. You can see the angle of incidence. You can mark. Okay, so the angle of incidence is the other term. Is another term that we need to be familiar with. Lots of terms. Lots of terms. The angle of incidence is the angle of incidence of a wing is the angle between the airplane's longitudinal axis and the core line of the wing, as you saw. We also have a dihedral. Now, here's another representation, or no, another photo, and this is also the T6. And we have a dihedral angle. So what you'll see is you will see the wing, you'll see the you'll see the root of the wing near the fuselage. That's pretty much a, a zero dihedral angle. But then as we get further and further out to the wingtips, you'll see that the angles, the angles are kind of increased. They're angle, the wings are angled upward, all right, off the lateral axis. And remember, the lateral axis runs from wingtip to wingtip. And straight line all right so that is our dihedral we could also have something called an anhedral all right and an aircraft that i can think of right off the top of my head that has an anhedral angle instead of being angled up instead of being angled down is an aircraft called the ab8 harrier ab8 harrier jump jet So let's let's see what anhedral looks like. So you notice that the longitudinal axis runs wingtip to wingtip, and you can see that the wings are angled downward. Okay. So there's many type of uh, there's different design factors. There's different design factors that they build in the aircraft. Um, it can have a dihedral, it can have an anhedral, um, or they could just be straight, depending on, it, it could just be straight, depending on what the designers want to do. You know, the, these guys, these smart guys, these aeronautical engineers, they get together and they say, hey, we gotta, we're, we're going to build a plane. So the wing design is pretty much one of the major, major, major factors, because that is what's going to be keeping that plane in the air once it leaves the ground and gets off of the landing gear. Okay. The next thing I'm going to talk about is the aircraft's center of gravity. All right. The center of gravity is pretty much where all, most, or not all the way, is pretty much concentrated. Um, we have a symbol for CG, and it looks like this. We got like a cross here in the middle. And so it will look something like this. That is our center of that. Um, and so most notably, what it will be, um, how it will look is in picture form. Give me a moment, folks. Aircraft center of gravity. Cool screen. <laughs> I don't have to do much. Now, you have to understand typically what we want. And there's another term that we need to look at as well. Basically, what I want you to just look at is basically we look at this aircraft. 
here. The center of gravity. So we can see the symbol here for the center of gravity. Center of gravity is basically where most of the weight is concentrated. And then we have the center of lift, which we talked about sort of kind of we, when we wanted that center of lift pretty much at normally it's 23 to 27% as we talked about earlier in the video. Um, typically, we want the center of lift to be behind the center of gravity. All right. So basically, what this does is the weight and the center of lift they form like what we call a, it looks like a class one lever, lever system. Okay, this will be kind of like the balancing part or the fulcrum. Or no, would it? Lift, nah, that's probably like a class three. No worries. Uh, we are not pretty, we're pretty much not going to talk about lever systems. Got it done with the mechanical comprehension in your um, test. But so I won't even try to identify that. I'll get back to that later because pretty much the airplane or the center of gravity is where your axes are, your axes are, are concentrated. So I couldn't call that a fulcrum. I could call that, so then, yeah, I guess I could call that a class three lever system. Yeah, class three. All right, you know I wasn't gonna let that go, right? <laughs> All right, so center of gravity is pretty much where most of the weight of the aircraft is concentrated and the aircraft pivots or moves around in three dimensions, be it yaw, roll, and pitch. All right. The elevator back here, which is um, used to control pitch, will pretty much move the tail down or up and you'll rotate around this, the center of gravity. Okay. All right, so it looks like we got about three minutes left on this hour. And again, this is like the introductory um, part of um, the API prep course. Um, the first three lessons of aerodynamics are going to be just, you know, they'll be out there free to watch. Um, and if you are preparing, if you've already passed your aviation selection test battery or your AFOQT and you actually have flight contract. We have the information that you need. All right. Um, we talked about the lunch too. I'm just trying to touch on one more thing because we have three minutes left. Okay, we can close out with angle of attack. The angle of attack. The angle of attack is the difference, the angular difference between the relative wind and the core line of the wing. Core line is again that imaginary line separating the upper and lower camber. That straight line and relative wind. Now, what the heck is relative wind? Have you ever been a little kid and you stuck your hand out of the window, or you were like on a roller coaster and you ah, you stuck your hand out? Okay. Well, typically how we think about it or how we teach as flight instructors, we say, okay, well, it appears like. It appears like keyboard. I don't want that to fall. Probably fall anyway, right? It appears as if we have our airfoil and it is flying through the air. So it looks like. the air molecules are moving around the airfoil. Okay, that's how it looks, because we put an arrow on this thing and everything. But the arrow is actually a vector, and it indicates a force. Actually, the air molecules are standing still, all right, because the air is still, the plane is actually moving through, or I should go this way, are moving through the air molecules. So the wing is actually disturbing the air molecules. In wind tunnel testing, we can see the smoke along the airfoil, and we see how the air reacts about or around the airfoil. Now, 
Um, I'm, actually, I'm going to just throw in something extra as well. Right, because if we're going to talk about angled attack, then we're going to talk about a couple other things. Okay, so the angle of attack. Let's draw a chord line. Uh, as as that is not a straight line, folks. Don't make fun of my artwork. Somebody out there is. All right, so the chord line is the imaginary line going from the leading edge to the trailing edge, and the angular difference between the relative wind. So there's an angle formed by the relative wind coming in like this and the chord line. So we'll just call this a zero degree angle of attack. Right. So that is relative wind. Um, there is a better, that is kind of like just a, a basic pictorial version of what relative wind is. I'd say relative wind is the airflow I started out just like that. The relative wind is the airflow, is the, um, the plane, the airplane experiences as it moves through the air. So a lot of a lot of people think, oh, the air is moving through the, the air is moving about the wind. Relatively speaking, yeah, that's true, and I guess that's why they call it relative wind. But the air is actually cutting through the air. Now this is called laminar airflow. This is beautiful. Wings love this laminar airflow. You ever laminate something? What happens? You got plastic kind of, it's like it's almost stuck. It's not really stuck because the plastic is not a part of the document that's being laminated, but it's very, very close, very, very close to the document. You know, it's almost like a credit card almost. All right. Like if we laminate it, it's my business card. Okay. If I just, I didn't want it to get wet and I wanted to laminate this so it was waterproof and it didn't get damaged. The plastic would stick very, very close to the card. And this card is pretty much thin. And the lamination would be, the plastic would be very, very close to the document that's being laminated. So this is laminar airflow. It's like the air molecules almost stick into the wing. And not necessarily, to, but almost like at a microscopic level. Because there are airflow behaviors about this wing at a microscopic level. Uh, when we talk about drag, we will, we will discuss that. But um, laminar airflow. Now, something happens. This is a zero degree angle of attack. So let's say we pull up, we pull back on our, we pull back on our control yoke or our control stick if we're talking about the T6. Um, let's say we pull up to a 10 degree angle of attack. And this is not exactly 10 degrees, so don't beat me up. All I want to show you is that there is an increase. Maybe it's like five to eight, but we will still get laminar airflow. All right. This is still a happy wing. All right. That is still a happy wing because we have nice airflow over the top and nice airflow to the bottom. All right. It's still with air molecules. So now. Boom, we bump the power, we pull back on a stick, we we tip, we tilt back. Okay. We increase the angle of attack. Here's our cord and our laminar airflow. So now what happens? We keep pulling up on the nose, pulling up on the nose. What we're gonna get is something called airflow separation. We're going to get airflow separation. We don't have that laminar airflow like we had before. That is a sad thing. Okay. Because what's going to happen is eventually, um, let's give ourselves another scenario where we pull up to something called a critical angle of attack. And I know this is really, really pronounced. All the products like, uh oh. It's harder than that or lower than that or whatever. So now we get some really extreme airflow separation. And they'll use the term airflow separation because the airflow is not laminar anymore. And I might as well just kind of, why not give you all three? Okay, so here's our chord line again. 
And we have three wings, which kind of, and don't laugh at my artwork, represents the same wing at different angles of attack. So here we got laminar airflow. We'll call it zero degrees angle of attack. Um, we'll call this 12 degrees. I did not use a protractor, so don't beat me up. And then let's say we have an 18 degree angle of attack. Okay. The angle of attack is the difference in degrees of between the relative wind and the chord line. So if we took a parallel line, we have a certain number of degrees here. On the parallel line, we have a larger amount of degrees here. So this is a zero degree angle of attack, 12 degree angle of attack, and 18 degrees of angle of attack. And this is the happy wing, this is the bad wing, or mad wing, and this is upset. Because this is the happy realm for a wing. <clears throat> the airflow is sticking to the wing. This is laminar airflow. As we pull up on the nose, or I should go this way, as we pull the nose up, pull the nose up and climb out, then we start to get airflow separation. So we see the wing as it relates to the relative wind, which is the green air molecules blowing about the airfoil at zero, 12, and 18 uh, degrees of angle of attack. So for the second lesson, I will close right there. All right. I hope you guys enjoyed watching this. I, I really enjoy doing this because um, it is, it affects a lot of lives. And what I mean by that is like, when you go to flight school, dude, it is a lot of information to learn. I mean, it's crazy. And you really don't have to go hard. I mean, this is a help, but you're going to have to push hard. I mean, being, becoming a pilot is probably one of the greatest challenges that you're going to face in your life. And I always believe in that concept, know before you go. And that's what the API the UPT prep course is all about. It's about knowing before you go. You know what I'm saying? Like, this information um, this is why a lot of people wash out. Because it's information overload. You got to study, you got to get the flashcards, you got to, you can't be partying and stuff like that, like college, man. You got to really, really go hard if you really, really want it. And if you really, really want it, you can obtain it. It's not hard. Um, I figure if thousands of people did it before you, you can do it. And thousands of people do after. So, you know, um, I decided to put this thing together because it's a lot of information to absorb. In addition to that, I recommend that you, you for my, um, actually probably both, uh, the United States Navy, Marine Corps, uh, and Coast Guard, and United States Air Force undergraduate pilot training grad, um, applicants, get the private pilot computer test book. Glime, or we Gleam or Glime, I don't know how you pronounce it. We always call it the Glime book. G-L-E-I-M or ASA, which is Aviation Supply, Aviation Supply, ASA, you just type in ASA, Private Pilot Test Book or GLIM, G-L-E-I-M, the Private Pilot Computer Test Book, Preparation Book. And um, there's information in there as well, okay? Like this is just kind of, you know, these couple videos that you see is not the whole course, um, but this with that, you know, if you got a, a considerable amount of time out, that is your time where you can absorb that information. So then when you get to API or initial flight screening or undergraduate pilot training, you'll be way, way ahead of the game. And so when they're looking at how you absorb, and me, myself, if I had this information, a student pilot, I wouldn't even, um, honestly, I wouldn't even um, not tell guys this. Don't tell them, oh, it's an API prep course. Don't do that. You will shine brighter if you just keep your mouth shut. Okay. Uh, if you just keep your mouth shut and just be like, you know, your instructor looks at you, wow, man, you are learning this really fast. You're really absorbing this material. Every instructor has an ego. You'd be like, um, well, it's I just like the way you teach it. And, you know, you teach it really clear. I, I, I love the way you teach. I like your teaching technique. Um, it's the way I learn. The instructor will have like, Big giant head. He can't even get out of the damn flight operations. You know what I'm saying? But be very, very humble. 
even though you know information, be humble. Don't, oh man, I took an API prep course and damn it, I'm going to fly F-18s or I'm going to fly the F-15. Because if you just appear like you're on a normal level, just appear like you're on a normal level, like you came there like everybody else and you don't know nothing from day one. But really, you do know the information. So when they give you these pop quizzes and pop tests and everything like that, you already know this information. You're boop, 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 boop. Okay? They're going to be like, damn, that kid is sharp. No, nobody absorbs his material like that, you know? And, you know, you say, oh, you know, uh, on YouTube, you know, I, I, I looked at a couple videos on YouTube and they explained it or, or whatever. If you do want to say, okay, I kind of looked at this stuff before I got here. So... I know that was lengthy. Uh, you know, I try to keep these under an hour. Uh, but, you know, if you're going to API, it's going to be one of the greatest challenges you've ever experienced. Not impossible, but it will be one of the greatest because you will be happy when you have those wings on your chest and um, you'll have the dream job that most people wish they could get to. So, um, you know, I guess that's really it. Not only do we do API prep, though, but we, all, we also do, you've been looking at my videos if you're subscribed to me, we also do all the military test prep for all tests, SIFT, United States Army SIFT, ASVAB for enlisted personnel, all branches, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine, Coast Guard. Um, I'm looking at my little notes on the wall just because those are all my testing little things. So I'm not crazy looking off to the side. The aviation selection test battery for pilot wannabes and naval flight officers. The Navy officer's aptitude rating test, I'm prepared for that too. It's really the ASTB, the ASTB has two more parts to it. And the armed forces officer's quali officer qualifications test. So I thank you guys for pressing on the play button and taking time out to uh, check out this video. There's gonna be another one concerning aviation and we will hit the other five, the other four areas of API uh, there'll be three introductory videos and stuff like that. So, you know, hey, if you like what you saw and you want to be prepared for API or the undergraduate pilot training, I suggest you get in contact with me. Either at stemwithkino at gmail.com is the email. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah, stemwithkino at gmail.com. And my website is stemwithkino.com. All right, so thanks for watching. I'm kind of looking at myself in my side, man. Well, that's pretty decent artwork. It's gotten pretty decent over the years. So I'm proud of myself there. So thanks for watching. Have a great night. Talk to you later.